Hello, this is Mike. In this screencast, I want to think about the early days when an organization is thinking about implementing a social media presence. I want to think in particular about some of the potential obstacles. And on the basis of that, I'll give the case for adopting a more strategic approach. And I'll finish by highlighting some examples of where having a clear social media strategy from the outset can yield tremendous business benefits. So let's think initially about those early days when an organization might be considering having a social media presence. Generally speaking, organizations are reluctant to start, not because they can't see there are benefits, but they simply just are not clear where to start. Uh, in other words, they can see it will yield results but they just don't know how to do the actual implementation. In my experience, organizations at this stage typically fall into two categories. First, there are those who understand what it could achieve and have a clear end goal in mind, but what they don't have is the route map to get there. In other words, they have the objective, but not the strategy for achieving it. Alternatively, there are those organizations who don't have a clear end goal in mind, or even a particular route towards a goal. Instead, they're suffering from what I call Me Too syndrome. They realize that either their competitors have Facebook or Twitter presence, something like that, or that their customers would like them to. They just can't quite work out what the clear purpose of each channel will be, and therefore this makes them reluctant. I'm generalizing, of course, but organizations do typically fall into one of these two categories when they're initially hesitant about adopting social media. Holloman suggests that these particular viewpoints or outcomes stem from what he calls FUD factors. First of all, there are those factors surrounding fear. Fear of security breaches, technological failure, and look, as a result of that probable reputational damage. So fear is a big driving factor in this. Next is uncertainty. Uncertainty in particular about a perceived loss of control. That loss of control might be external. Well, if we have a Facebook page, perhaps people will post negative comments about our product or brand. It might be a perceived loss of internal control. What if our employees get it wrong. How will we know that they're really on Twitter for our benefit rather than conducting their social lives? This type of thing, a lack of control, at least a perceived one. And finally, there are doubts, doubts on the impact on the organization itself. You know, I know a senior manager who regularly complains to me that whenever he walks into one of his offices, there's lots of people on Facebook. And in particular, he has massive concerns about what he sees as a perceived loss of productivity. What are they doing here? The reality, of course, is that they're being more productive. What the administrators in his offices are doing is responding to demand. They recognize that key stakeholders, particularly customers, want to communicate with them via social media. And what's actually happening there is that email and telephone traffic is being reduced through the use of social media. So in reality, they're more productive, not less. So FUD factors, they can impede senior management buy-in, and they can create the conditions under which organizations fall into one of those two categories I discussed previously. On that basis then, we clearly need a social media strategy in order to manage a successful implementation. So it's time to be think about how exactly I'm going to define what an SMS is. Let's unpick the term beginning at the end with the word strategy. To me, and to Golden, a strategy is a plan, a course of action. It's a route map to a specific goal or destination with all of the resources lined up along the way 
needed to achieve it. So that's what being strategic is all about, planning the route. Social media, here I'm using the term to refer to all sorts of Web2 technologies that offer a means of communication, collaboration, a way of cultivating a sense of community and connectedness between people and organizations. So it's about using technology to create a social presence. If we put the two things together, then logically we come up with my definition of a social media strategy. I see it as the planned and systematic leveraging of interactive, collaborative, conversational resources. And the whole thing is being leveraged in order to achieve specific objectives. So that's what a social media strategy is to me. Having a clear business goal and a strategic route with all of the resources required in order to get to your destination. When organizations do this, the benefits are enormous. Some examples from the literature that I picked out just to illustrate the point. Marriott had a clear blog-driven strategy that allowed them to generate $500 million worth of new bookings every year through their online presence. Bonovo switched a lot of the activities of their telephone call centers to social networking, particularly Twitter and achieved a 20% reduction in operating costs. The Royal Bank of Canada, they recognized that customers wanted to communicate them with, with them via a variety of social media channels. And they not only made their organization more efficient, they got an 18 point improvement in satisfaction ratings from their customers. The designer, Jimmy Chu, achieved a 33% increase in sales simply by tweeting the locations of his stores. And finally, Cadbury's, in a very clever marketing tactic, used a fan petition, which they in fact instigated, to not only have a campaign to bring back a popular brand, the Whisper Chocolate Bar, but to achieve sales of 40 million units, or four bars of chocolate every second, in just 18 weeks. So leveraging social media in a strategic way can deliver real returns on investment. Of course, there are potential costs and organizations often overlook these. Platforms are typically free to join, not always, but generally. But, well, it's a common thing that organizations will underestimate the costs of actually developing and maintaining the presence, particularly manpower costs. You know, if people are not answering telephones or emails, they do need to be monitoring social media. There are also skills gaps that are often underestimated and often it takes very expensive external consultants or trainers to help address these. It's a fact that around 80% plus of UK universities, for example, use social media as a primary tool for recruiting prospective students. But if you look at those universities, actually less than 20% of them have academics using social media channels in the classroom for program delivery. The academic skills gap is what universities are very actively working now and investing in to attempt to address it. And finally, people underestimate how long it takes to get a return on investment. You know, sometimes you strike lucky, like in any marketing activity. Something on social media goes viral and you get a quick return on investment. In most cases, however, the reality is just like other channels, it tends to be a slower process. And, you know, it takes time to establish a social presence. So, what are the key takeaways from this? Getting started, organizations often either don't have a clear route or a clear destination in mind. They typically get plagued by fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which not only impedes the development of strategy, but also impairs senior management buy-in. I hope I've convinced you that a social media strategy is about having both of those things addressed. It's about having a clear destination 
a route to achieve it and all the resources stacked up in order to navigate that route. Get all those things right and I'd argue that the business case for social media is very, very clear. Thank you.